When I first became interested in the subjects of this Third Testament, St. Augustine, Pascal, Blake, Kierkegaard, Tolstoy and Bonhoeffer, I saw them separately as six characters in search of God. Thinking about them afterwards, it became clear to me that though they were all quintessentially men of their time, they had in common a special role to relate their time to eternity. This has to be done every so often. Otherwise, we forget that when the law of self-sufficiency proves too strong or despair too overwhelming, men need to be called back to God to rediscover humility and with it, hope. In the case of the Old Testament Jews, it was the prophets who thus called them back to God. Then came the New Testament when through the Incarnation, God became his own prophet. Nor was even that the end of testaments and prophets. Between the fantasy of the ego and the truth of love, between the darkness of the will and the light of the imagination, there will always be a bridge and a prophetic voice calling us to cross it. So august, when Rome fell, and like a later Noah, he was constrained to construct an ark, in his case called orthodoxy, wherein his church could survive through the dark days that lay ahead. Thanks largely to him, the light of the New Testament didn't go out with Rome's, remaining amidst the debris of a fallen empire to light the way to another civilization, Christendom, whose legatees we are. It was as though he'd been specially groomed for the task, tempered in the fires of his own sensuality, toughened by his arduous exploration of the age's many heresies, for instance, Manichaeism, a master of words, which, written or spoken, he offered in God's service, first asking that God would give him the wherewithal to offer. No one knows for certain what Augustine looked like, but we have the image of his time in contemporary mosaics, and the North African countryside he belonged to remains. In Augustine's eyes, Rome stood at the very pinnacle of history. He saw it as the secular state carried to the highest degree of perfection and providing the only tolerable framework of life for mankind. Its disappearance from our human scene, if so unthinkable a catastrophe were ever to occur, would leave behind not other alternative civilizations, but a vacuum, a darkness. Augustine's own North Africa partook of this glory. Carthage was a little Rome. The abundant harvests, the flourishing cities and ports, the entertainments and spectacles, all signified participation in the great Roman Empire, which to Augustine was the whole world.
The people and the prosperity have vanished, now only to be imagined from the ruins of their former magnificence. Augustine was born in the year 354, some 40 years after Christianity had become the acknowledged religion of the Roman Empire under Constantine. His birthplace was here in this hilly district of North Africa, then known as Numidia. In one of the many small towns, like this one, Duga, which was scattered about what was then a rich and luxuriant countryside, his father, Patricius, belonged to the middle classes and was reasonably well off, except that he was a victim of the very excessive taxation which characterized those troubled years. He was, I suppose you could say, a worldly man who remained a pagan till right at the end of his life when he was belatedly baptized a Christian. Augustine's mother, Monica, on the other hand, was a Christian of tremendous piety, without any question. Her devotions and meditations were conducive to his not fulfilling his father's purpose and becoming a successful lawyer or civil servant, but, as she hoped, dedicating his life to the service of Christ and the church. She made him a saint, and his sanctity resulted in due course in her being canonized. His studies went easily. He excelled and quite soon became a teacher of rhetoric, a rather empty and pretentious discipline, which in those days was very highly regarded, rather as sociologists is are today. He, looking back on it, called it contemptuously, being a vendor of words. Alas, my own trade. By the end of the fourth century, the decadence which had afflicted Rome had spread to the North African provinces, especially, of course, to the great port and metropolis of Carthage, at whose university Augustine studied and later taught. Thence, he transferred to Rome, because he said he found the Carthage students too turbulent, a very contemporary touch. In Rome, he easily consorted with some of the most famous figures of the time and was appointed to the chair of rhetoric in Milan, which brought him into contact with the imperial court and what was much more important from the point of view of his subsequent career with the famous and saintly Bishop Ambrose. So, at the age of 30, he'd reached the summit of a career with a dazzling prospect before him. But somehow, he remained totally unsatisfied. He called his university appointment his chair of lies, knowing in his heart that God had some other purpose for him, which, try as he might, he would never be able to escape. Games in the theatre were given over to wildly expensive spectacles of violence and eroticism, like the cinema and increasingly television today. To judge by the way that after his conversion, Augustine never lost an opportunity of thundering against such spectacles, it's reasonable to assume that he was by no means immune to their appeal. There's also the touching story in the confessions of his friend who, with a great effort, managed to break his addiction to the games then was tricked into going to them, and venturing to open just one of his eyes, was hooked again.
The pagan temples still functioned, but few attended or heeded them. The Christian churches, now under state patronage, were not strong enough to counteract or even always to resist the prevailing atmosphere of luxury, violence and self-indulgence. Augustine himself, with his sensual disposition and inquiring mind, was little disposed to hold aloof. Though a certain fastidiousness in him, intellectually and physically, prevented him from succumbing wholly to a way of life which, if he had, would assuredly have destroyed him. Living now, I should say, find it easier to get inside Augustine's unregenerate skin than perhaps any of the intervening generations. The similarity between his circumstances and ours is striking, not to say alarming. There's the same moral vacuity, leading to the same insensate passion for new sensations and experiences. The same fatuous credulity, opening the way to every kind of charlatanry and quackery, from fortune-telling to psychoanalysis. The same sinister combination of great wealth and pointless ostentation with appalling poverty and unheeded affliction. Oh, greedy men, Augustine wrote, what will satisfy you if God himself will not? We know what it was like. We know, too, that to a temperament sensual and imaginative, like Augustine, sexual indulgence makes the greatest appeal, precisely because it offers a kind of fraudulent ecstasy, joys that expire when the neon lights go out. There's nothing so powerful, he said, when he was a bishop, in drawing the spirit of a man downwards as the caresses of a woman. He was speaking from experience, and I, for what it's worth, endorse his opinion. To a provincial like the young Augustine, the Mediterranean seen from this North Africa coast seemed like the gateway to the larger world of Rome. I dare say the young Emerson or the young Henry James or for that matter the young T.S. Eliot saw the Atlantic in the same sort of way. After all, Augustine was a very ambitious man and in his time, as in ours, Eminence at letters or as an academic could lead to positions of great power and responsibility. Also, I think, he wanted to escape from the watchful eye of his mother, Monica, and indulge freely 
in what Pascal called licking the earth, and Augustine, after his conversion, called scratching the itching sore of lust. So, one night, to avoid the pain and embarrassment of saying goodbye to his mother, taking with him his mistress and their son, Adeodatus, he slipped away across the sea. It was, on any showing, a very unkind thing to do. And afterwards, his contrition for it was very great. So it was the most natural thing in the world for Augustine to make his way to Rome and thence to the emperor's court at Milan to seek his fortune. Worldly success was his for the taking. This book, Augustine's Confessions, is really the first autobiography in the modern sense ever written. So we know more about him than about any other figure in antiquity. Of course, it's not just an account of what happened to him, of his life. It's also an account of the quest for truth in which he was engaged. And so the culminating point in it, from his point of view at any rate, is his conversion. He naturally thought, like St. Paul, that this conversion happened at a particular moment. But actually, it was the result of a long process, which began even before he was aware of it. Knowing his nature, Monica had hurried after her son to Milan to watch over him there and pray for his soul's redemption. Some of the friends he'd made among the amusing, the cultivated and the well-born turned out to be Christians, which came as something of a surprise to Augustine, who in North Africa had associated Christianity with the poor and the lowly. In Italy, a great Roman administrator like Ambrose might renounce his career to become a bishop, and rich heiresses dispose of all their property to the church. It was under Ambrose's influence that Augustine began to study the scriptures, noting particularly the spiritual meaning of Old Testament stories which had formerly made little impression on him. This played an important part in his final deliverance from Manichaeism and his ultimate conversion. Representations of Christ as an idealized young Roman no doubt came as a surprise to Augustine and impressed him. And how poignant must have seemed to him the figure of Christ before Pilate, the type of Roman governor which at one time Augustine perhaps aspired to be. The climax of Augustine's conversion occurred in a garden in Milan and its fulfillment in another garden in the country. I think he must have loved gardens. He seemed to see truth most clearly in them. There's one episode in the process leading up to his conversion that particularly takes my fancy. He writes, my misery was complete, and I remember how one day you made me realize how utterly wretched I was. I was preparing a speech in praise of the emperor, intending that it should include a great many lies, which would certainly be applauded by an audience who knew well enough how far from the truth they were. I was greatly preoccupied by this task, and my mind was feverishly busy with its harassing problems. As I walked along one of the streets of Milan, I noticed a poor beggar, who must, I suppose, have had his fill of food and drink, since he was laughing and joking. Contrasting their two conditions, 
He's so troubled. The beggar's so cheerful. He cried out in desperation. Will you never see setting your heart on shadows and following a lie? His anguish and contrition are all too actual to me after more than 40 years in the same sort of profession. Nonetheless, Augustine's mind continued to be occupied with thoughts of fame and success. And he was planning a rich marriage, having very callously sent away the mistress he brought from North Africa, who'd lived with him for 15 years, and keeping with himself their son, Adeodatus, on whom he doted. Then matters came to a head. It happened in the garden of the house where he and Olympias lived. They had the use of this garden because the owner was away and didn't live there. I now found, he writes, myself driven by the tumult in my breast to take refuge in this garden where no one could interrupt that fierce struggle in which I was my own contestant until it came to its conclusion. In this mood, he suddenly heard the sing-song voice of a child in a nearby house. Whether it was the voice of a boy or a girl, I can't say. But again and again, it repeated the refrain, take it and read it, take it and read. So he rushed back to where he'd left a copy of the Gospels open at the St. Paul's Epistle to the Romans and read, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in lust and wantonness, not in quarrels and rivalries. Rather, arm yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Spend no more thought on nature and nature's appetites. I had no wish, he writes, to read more and no need to do so. For in an instant, as I came to the end of the sentence, it was as though the light of confidence flooded into my heart and all the darkness and doubt was dispelled. One must suppose that this great conversion which had befallen Augustine, this light which had shone into his life and was never again going to leave it, had turned him away from this world. On the contrary, it made him more conscious than ever before of its joys and its beauties, more aware than ever he'd been of the terrific privilege it was to be allowed to exist in time. There's a stupendous passage in the Confessions that I love very much, in which he asks the earth itself, the winds that blow, and the whole air, and all that lives in it, what is my God? Likewise, the sky, the moon, and the stars, what is my God? None of these was God, he was told. He went on to speak to all the things that are about me, all that can be admitted by the door of the senses. They too, he was told, were not God. Then at last he understood. Their beauty was all the answer they could give and the only answer he needed to hear.
Following his conversion, Augustine set out with Monica to return to North Africa, resolving to dedicate the remaining years of his life wholly to the service of Christ. They reached the port of Ostia, and there were delayed because the Mediterranean was infested with pirates and no boats would put to sea. How different was the Augustine returning to North Africa from the one who'd left for Rome, now as avid to leave the world as then he'd been to plunge into it, as ardently in search of obscurity as then of fame. It was while they were waiting in Austria that Augustine and Monica had an extraordinary mystical experience, which is described in the Confessions with incomparable artistry and skill. They were looking out of the window of the house they were staying in onto the courtyard below and talking together serenely and joyfully of the eternal life of the saints, which they agreed no bodily pleasure, however great it might be, and how whatever earthly light might shed lustre upon it, was worthy of comparison or even mention. As they talked on, ranging over the whole compass of material things in their various degrees, up to the very heavens themselves, they came to survey the eternal wisdom. Longing for it and straining for it, Augustine says, with all the strength of their hearts. Then they reached out and touched this eternal wisdom, which, like eternity itself, is neither in the past nor the future, but just is. Touched it only to return, leaving, Augustine writes, our spiritual harvest bound to it, to the sound of our own speech, in which each word has a beginning and an end, far, far different from your word, our Lord, who abides in himself forever, yet never grows old, and gives new life to all things. Who that's ever tried to give expression to the perspectives and shape of this creation in which we live, using these clumsy bricks, these words with a beginning and end, will not feel awed that so great a writer as Augustine should feel so. It was after this experience that Monica told Augustine that she had nothing left to live for since God had granted her every wish and more besides, now that she saw her son, his servant, and knew that he had spurned such joys as this world had to offer. Nine days later, she was dead, and Augustine, leaving her mortal remains in Ostia, returned here to North Africa to undertake his great life's work. This was no less than to salvage from a world in ruins the Christian faith, in order that it might provide the basis for a new splendid civilization, which would grow great, and then in its time falter and fail. As men forgot the eternal wisdom that Monica and Augustine had glimpsed at Ostia, and sought to find in their own mortal bodies the joy of living, and there in their own mortal minds its meaning. Augustine's last reference to his mother in the Confessions is to ask everyone who reads the book to remember Monica, your servant, and with her, Patricius, her husband, who died before her, by whose bodies you brought me into this life. Through the centuries, 
Monica has been duly remembered. As for Augustine himself, the whole of the rest of his life was spent here in North Africa. He never crossed the sea again. His idea was to gather a few similarly inclined friends round him and share with them a monastic life on his small estate in the hills where he was born. It was not to be. His gifts were too famous and too precious, and the need for leadership in the church too great for him to be left in peace. As he told his congregation many years later, when he'd long been a bishop, he came here to Hippo, now a Naba in Algeria, to see a friend whom he hoped to persuade to join him in the monastic life. Feeling secure because Hippo had a bishop, he came to this cathedral, whose foundations can still be clearly seen. But he was recognized, grabbed, made a priest, and in due course, a bishop. Augustine wept when almost under compulsion, he was first ordained a priest. Probably he'd have had difficulty himself in explaining just what his tears were about. But one of the causes was certainly the dream he then lost of a life of prayer and meditation away from a troubled world. He was 43 when he first mounted the cathedra as Bishop of Hippo, one of the many small Roman ports along the North African coast. Thenceforth, he was endlessly involved in the duties and responsibilities of his office and the often bitter controversies of his time. Contemplating Augustine's achievement, one stands amazed. By becoming their bishop, he had in truth become the servant of his congregation, those volatile Christians of North Africa, whose feelings he understood so well. Preaching to them often daily, spending his mornings adjudicating their private disputes, constantly available to any one of them in need of help or counsel, and all the while conducting an enormous correspondence. His administrative burden was very great. I see him here in his study at Hippo, a man withdrawn from the commotion around him, despite his great fame and involvement in his troubled times, somehow isolated as though, after all, in his own inner sanctity, he'd achieved the monastic life he so longed for. Though Augustine detested it, his work necessitated much traveling. The roads were dangerous, as the North African countryside was infested with wild bands of religious fanatics, supporters of the heretical Donatists, whose bitter enemy he was. Gatherings of the North African hierarchy brought him most often to this great metropolitan church of Carthage, where Augustine delivered many of his greatest polemics, placing his dazzling gifts unreservedly at the service of his church. His public utterances and writings are full of arresting, challenging phrases, as fresh and relevant to our years as to those who first heard them. For instance, this is the door of the Lord, the righteous shall enter in, was written on the lintel of a church in Numidia. The man who enters, however, wrote Augustine, is bound to see drunkards, misers, tricksters, gamblers, adulterers, fornicators, people wearing amulets, assiduous clients of sorcerers and astrologers. He must be warned that the same crowds that press into the churches on Christian festivals also fill the theatres on pagan holidays. And on the subject of the theatre itself, wherever the towering mass of the theatres erected, their foundations of Christian virtue are undermined. And while this insane expenditure gives to the sponsors a glorious result, men mock at the works of mercy. It is only charity that distinguishes the children of God from the children of the devil. They all make the sign of the cross and answer Amen and sing Alleluia. They all go to church 
and build up the walls of the basilicas. But it is only charity that distinguishes the children of God from the children of the devil. Take away the barriers afforded by the laws, men's brazen capacity to do harm, their urge to self-indulgence would rage to the full. No king in his kingdom, no general with his troops, no husband with his wife, no father with his son could hope to stop by any threat or punishment the license that would follow, the sheer sweet taste of sinning. Give me a man in love. He knows what I mean. Give me one who yearns. Give me one who's hungry. Give me one far away in this desert who's thirsty and sighs for the spring of the eternal country. Give me that sort of man. He knows what I mean. But if I speak to a cold man, he just doesn't know what I'm talking about. You're surprised that the world is losing its grip that the world is grown old. Don't hold on to the old man, the world. Don't refuse to regain your youth in Christ who says to you, the world is passing away. The world's losing its grip. The world's short of breath. Don't fear. Thy youth shall be renewed as an eagle. Though no one has ever been more insistent on the need for purity, equally, no one has ever been less of a Puritan in the pejorative sense. Everything in creation delighted Augustine. He spoke to his congregation of the glorious changing colors of the Mediterranean, which he'd so often observed. All created things should be loved, he insisted, because God made them. The sea, the creatures, everything that is speaks of God. It was because he was so aware of the universality of God's love and presence that he could easily communicate with all sorts and conditions of men. For instance, the fisherman at Hippo. It will not be held against you, he once said, that you are ignorant against your will, but that you neglect to seek out what it is that makes you ignorant. Not that you cannot bring together your wounded limbs, but you reject him that would heal them. Again, like his master, like the Gospels themselves, he used everyday imagery to make his points, as when he compares God's gifts to us, to a man giving his girl a bracelet. If she so delights in the bracelet as to forget the giver, that is an insult to him. But if she so delights in the bracelet as to love the giver more, that was what the bracelet was for. We take for granted the slow miracle whereby water in the irrigation of a vineyard becomes wine. It's only when Christ turns water into wine in quick motion, as it were, that we stand amazed. And there was always the North African countryside. When all is said and done, is there any more marvelous sight, any occasion when human reason is nearer to some sort of converse with the nature of things than the sowing of seeds, the planting of cuttings, the transplanting of shrubs, the grafting of slips? It's as though you could question the vital force in each root and bud on what it can do and what it cannot and why. So this scintillating mind lives on in his words, taking account of the times they were living through and the fears and anxieties they generated and brushing aside empty hopes of fashioning a better world out of mere mortal hopes for one. I no longer wished for a better world because I was thinking of the whole of creation and in the light of this clearer discernment, I've come to see that though the higher things are better than the lower, the sum of all creation 
is better than the higher things alone. Augustine was 56, and here in Carthage, when in the year 410, someone came and told him that Rome had been sacked. It must have been a moment of very great drama in his life. Of course, he knew that something of the kind was liable to happen and had prepared himself and his flock as far as he could for it. Don't lose heart, brothers, he told them. There will be an end to every earthly king. And if this is actually the end now, God sees. Even so, he continued to nourish the hope as people do when a great disaster looms, that somehow it wouldn't happen. In our time, as in Augustine's, we've witnessed great disasters. And we know how the flame of hope burns on. I remember very well, on a bright August Sunday afternoon, standing on Camden Hill, in the year 1940, and hearing the roar of the first wave of the Luftwaffe coming over London, and thinking it can't happen. But of course, it did. Like many of my generation, I felt that the cities of Western civilization had been morally bombed before the actual bombs began to fall. But Augustine loved and revered Rome. He saw it not just the sim as the symbol of a great empire, but as signifying civilization itself. Everything that he'd admired and aspired after. When he was growing up and a student in the great metropolis that this ruin once was, art, literature, all the things he wanted to achieve, all that, as Talleyrand called it, when he witnessed, as he thought, the ruin of French civilization, douceur de vivre, sweetness of life. Augustine's first duty was to hearten his flock and prevent panic and demoralization, which the flood of refugees which had already begun to arrive in North Africa from Rome might well have brought about. In a sermon that he delivered at the time, he compared the capture of Rome by Alaric with the destruction of Sodom, pointing out that in the latter case, everyone had perished and the city had been eradicated, never to exist again. In Rome, there were many survivors, including all who'd taken refuge in churches, Alaric himself being an Arian Christian. There'd been a great deal of destruction, of course, but, Augustine pointed out, cities consist of men, not of walls, which can be rebuilt. Rome had been chastised, but not destroyed. The world, he said, reels under crushing blows. The old man is shaken out. The flesh is pressed. The spirit turns to clear flowing oil. Then he turned to the deeper question of the relations between earthly cities like Rome, which men build and destroy, which have their day rising and falling like everything in time, and the heavenly city or city of God, which is everlasting. The question occupied him for the next 17 years, almost to the end of his life, and resulted in the production of his great work of genius, the city of God, which, directly or indirectly, has influenced the thought of Christians on what they owe to God and what to Caesar through the succeeding 15 centuries. We live perforce and always must in earthly cities. They, as it were, 
are our location, our set, with history for our script. At the same time, we're unique in all creation, in being capable of envisaging a heavenly city, not susceptible to the ravages of time, existing beyond the dark jungle of the human will. As St. Paul put it, and Augustine echoed, here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Pursuing his theme, Augustine ranges over the whole of human history as then understood, whose debris we here survey. His conclusions lose none of their force in the light of whatever's been invented, concluded, and speculated upon in the subsequent 15 centuries. The centuries of past history, Augustine wrote, would have rolled by like empty jars if Christ had not been foretold by them. These were the two motives which drove the Romans to their wonderful achievements, liberty and the passion for the praise of men. What else was there for them to love save glory? For through glory they desired to have a kind of life after death on the lips of those who praised them. The heavenly city outshines Rome beyond comparison. There, instead of victory, is truth. Instead of high rank, holiness. Instead of peace, felicity. Instead of life, eternity. Take Aristotle, put him near to the rock of Christ, and he fades away into nothingness. Who is Aristotle? When he hears the words, Christ said, then he shakes in hell. Pythagoras said this, Plato said that. Put them near to the rock and compare these arrogant people with him who was crucified. In our fallen state, our imperfection, we can conceive perfection. Through the incarnation, the presence of God among us in the lineaments of man, we have a window in the walls of time, which looks out onto this heavenly city. This was Augustine's profoundest conclusion. And in his great work, he enshrined it imperishably, to be a comfort and a light in the dark days that lay ahead when the triumphant vandals would cross into Africa, reaching the walls of Hippo itself as he lay dying there in the year 430. Today, the earthly city looks ever larger, to the point where it may be said to have taken over the heavenly one. Turning away from God, blown up with the arrogance that their fabulous success in exploring and harnessing the mechanism of life has generated men believe themselves to be at last in charge of their own destiny. As we survey the disastrous consequences of such an attitude, the chaos and destruction it's brought, as Augustine did, the fall of Rome and its aftermath, his words on that other occasion still stand, applicable, as he says, to all circumstances and conditions of men irrespective of nationality, regime, language, all the criteria whereby we separate race from race and community from community. In its sojourn here, he writes, 
the heavenly city makes use of the peace provided by the earthly city. In all that relates to the mortal nature of man, it preserves and indeed seeks the concordance of human wills. It refers the earthly peace to the heavenly peace, which is truly such peace that it alone can be described as peace. For it is the highest degree of ordered and harmonious fellowship in the enjoyment of God and of another in God. When this stage is reached, then there will be life. Not life subject to death, but life that is clearly and assuredly life-giving. There will be a body, not a body which is animal, weighing down the soul as it decays, but a spiritual body, experiencing no need and subordinated in every part to the will. This is the peace that the heavenly city has while it sojourns here in faith. And in this faith, it lives a life of righteousness, to the establishing of that peace, it refers all its good actions, whether they be towards God or towards one's neighbor. For the life of this city is utterly and entirely a life of fellowship.